the M1 rifle. It was the infantry weapon for US forces during World War II and Korea. On film, there isn't an American World War II movie without one. The M1 was easily one of the best rifles of World War II, and a massive leg up over the bolt-action rifles that were standard issue in every major army. So let's take a look at this prolific game-changing rifle that General George S. Patton called the greatest battle implement ever devised. Now comes the American Army. Places, please. Light the lights. Roll camera. Action! The official designation of the M1 is U.S. Rifle Caliber 30 M1, and was often just called the M1 by soldiers. Caliber 30 M1, a clip-fed, shoulder-fired, semi-automatic weapon designed to bring death. It's rare to hear the title Garand or Garand on film. Fire, you son of a... Garand and Garand was a moniker more popular with civilians during and after the war. This name was given to the rifle in honor of the French-Canadian-born John Garand, the weapons designer. Though both pronunciations are common and accepted, Garand is considered the correct way to pronounce the designer's name. Hold your fire. However you pronounce the name, the M1 was considered one of the most effective weapons of World War II. And for anyone who thinks otherwise, your weekend pass is revoked. Before the M1, the main service rifle of the U.S. Army was the M1903 Springfield bolt-action rifle. And though the 1903 would continue to see service by snipers throughout the war and Marines during the early years of the war, the M1 would replace the majority of units equipped with 1903s outside of specialty roles. Marines who saw some of the first fighting in the Pacific with 1903 rifles were annoyed when the Army showed up with new M1s, something HBO's The Pacific pays tribute to. Army gets the new stuff we fought with shit my grandfather used. A 1903 in the right hands had an effective firing range of 1,000 meters, compared to the M1's effective firing range of around 500. However, the vast majority of combat for American troops was taking place well within the M1's range. An M1 held eight 30 6 rounds and had a rate of fire between 40 and 50 rounds a minute, about double that of a well-trained soldier on the Springfield 1903. <laughs> During World War II, 5.4 million M1s were made and used by every branch of the United States military, and they made up the bulk of rifle companies in both the Pacific and Europe. The M1 was well liked by virtually all who used it. It weighed about the same as the Thompson submachine gun, but hit as hard as its bolt action counterparts. The rate of fire for the M1 was effective against the Japanese, as it gave squads light and mobile firepower in jungle terrain. In Europe, the M1 helped even the odds for American squads, opposing German machine guns with their extreme rates of fire. Name? Lord George. Dirt in the rear sight aperture, pass revoked. There were some disadvantages to the M1. It was slightly bulky to house the semi-automatic operating system, making it a little less ergonomic for smaller hands. It was difficult to load unless using a full clip. There's also a myth that an enemy soldier would wait to hear the distinct ping, which telegraphed a soldier was reloading. But during any sort of squad level combat, there's no way an enemy soldier was listening for this. this Speak up, sir, my hearing is not goes. so good. German grenade Comes and goes, the, the German yeah. grenade went up right by my head. One of the more famous, call it disadvantages, if a user is not careful loading an M1 clip, or more commonly closing the bolt while unloaded, the bolt can slip and slam forward on a user's thumb. The scene from 71 into the fire showcases a nice dramatization of how this might feel. Though several variants of the M1 were produced during World War II, they were a rare thing. The most common variant you'll find on cinema are the sniper variant, the M1C and M1D. You are them, dog face. I need practice. The M1 sniper rifles saw very limited use in World War II and were only meant to supplement the use of 1903 sniper rifles. But in Korea, these rifles would see more use. M1Cs were a rushed engineering job that were quickly made inferior to M1Ds, 
which chose to mount the scope to the barrel and not the receiver, which weakened it significantly. Name. Please God, Joseph D. Shuck. Rusty bayonet, leave God. You want to kill Germans? Yes, sir. Not with this. One popular use of the M1 on film is with bayonets, or M7 grenade launchers. Though bayonet charges were becoming less common by World War II, they still occurred. The Crossroads Battle is one excellent example of a bayonet charge as an effective tool against an unknown or concealed enemy position. Won't be able to shoot it straight with that thing on. One interesting scene from Banner Brothers is where Sergeant Bull Randleman advises a new replacement soldier not to fix his bayonet. There is truth to these words, particularly firing at long range, as it's basically a weight at the very end of the rifle, and can throw off the balance of the weapon, and if you are really proficient, you might notice the harmonics or vibration of the barrel change. The M7 grenade launcher was a device also designed by John Garand, and adopted by the US military in 1943. It's not so much a grenade launcher but a grenade adapter, as it doesn't launch anything itself, rather harnesses the pressure of firing a blank cartridge from the M1. The M7 grenade launcher could fire up to 200 meters. These were actually fairly common. One to three were issued per rifle squad, and they could fire a number of different types of grenades. However, in Battle of the Bulge, almost going out of their way to be anachronistic, shows an M1 firing an M61 heat round from the 1960s. Ultimately, the M1 was one of the most successful firearms of World War II. It had the ideal range, stopping power, and rate of fire for the majority of engagements. It was cost-effective, reliable, highly accurate. Significantly, it had inner workings that share much in common with modern assault rifles, even the AK-47. So influential was the M1, the Japanese even tried copying it with the Type 4 rifle. In Korea, the M1 proved its qualities all over again and did well in the cold and mountainous conditions where its accuracy and effective firing range was ideal. Eventually the M14 would replace the M1, which offers select fire and a 20 round magazine. The M14 incorporated features of both the M1 rifle and M1 carbine. Today the M1 continues to be an icon within the American military, with every branch and many paramilitary organizations using the rifle for ceremonial purposes. Alright, I'm Johnny. Thanks for watching this brief overview on the M1. As always, I'm just an amateur war movie fan, so feel free to add any info in the comment section below, and we'll see you in the next video.